Right now, this will be the sermon that I will make the last one for the present on the matter of persecution. And our, as, our, as Christians are dealing with it and dealing with it as the Scripture teaches us. And you know, as I said this morning, that in the last week's sermons, we studied how Jesus warned those who would be his faithful followers of persecution that would come upon them because they loved and obeyed the truth because of the gospel message they preached and defended. And he therefore charged what would later, after the church was established, be the body of Christ, that they should expect this when they practiced, preached, and defended, without compromise, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But today, what do we face? We read about how that all went on back then under a different government, different situation, different culture and all. Well, remember, the truth is the truth is the truth regardless of the generation in which we find ourselves on this earth. Today, denominationalism, secularism, and atheistic materialism, all of these combined or separate get together in one way or the other, to one extent or the other, to ensure that the Lord's faithful, the Lord's church, Christians, will be cast into the role of hate-filled oppressors. It's to the advantage of the devil to do that. The devil's the father of lies. He was a murderer from the beginning. There's no truth in him. The devil does not just as a person, in which he is a supernatural person, he doesn't just float down through the air and come to set upon us like a mosquito might. He works through agents. How do you become an agent of Satan? You simply live contrary to the teaching of God. It's that simple. And when you live contrary to the teachings of Jesus Christ, you are a child of the devil and an agent of Satan. Now think of it for a minute. There are only children of Satan and children of God in this world. There are no halfway whatevers. You're either on God's side. As Jesus said, you're either with me or against me. Which means you're either a New Testament Christian in the Lord's church, living faithful to him as the New Testament sets out that faithful conduct, or you're not. Now, you may have never even obeyed the gospel, or you may have obeyed the truth and then, due to the allurements of the world, gone back into the ways of the world. Or you could just be overtaken in a certain trespass and not repent of it. And that can only be compounded if that goes on. But be that as it may, servants of Satan are people who are not at all interested in obeying the truth. Of course, there's false religion. That's been true ever since the Bible was being revealed all down through history. There have been false teachers. Peter, in warning Christians, said as there were false teachers among the prophets, false prophets, there shall be among you. Furthermore, when secularism atheistic materialism, or even a religion and or a religion combined with civil government to oppose New Testament Christianity, then the prospect of persecution becomes even worse. In the first century, when you read your New Testament, you see that originally... Christ was persecuted and put to death by the Jews. As we studied last week and again mentioned this morning, he warned his followers that if they hated me, they will hate you. But he also told them, uh, be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. Before that, he had said, the world hates you, it hated me, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. 
But nevertheless, the reality of it is there. There's no use pretending it's not. If you're going to be faithful, there will be some kind and to a certain degree persecution. So this particular study, sort of trying to pull everything together we've done, gives emphasis to, first of all, avoiding persecution. That's the first thing we want to look at in Christians dealing with being persecuted because you're a Christian. We're not talking about some thief that breaks into your house and you're Christians. That's not necessarily in and of itself a persecution of you because you're a Christian. They're just a thief breaking in your house. It could be to where there are people in a society who, quote, pick on, unquote, Christians and try to do whatever what and taking their property and ruining. That, that's certainly true. But the first thing we want to look at in, in our dealing with persecution is our avoiding of it, if at all possible, and rightly. We'll see about that in a moment. The next point is enduring persecution. Now, you've heard a lot in the last three sermons that talk about how we bear up under persecution when we're being persecuted for righteousness' sake, for living like the Bible says, for teaching the truth. And the third, these are three points we'll notice. How resisting persecution may relate to the first two, avoiding persecution and enduring persecution. Grounds and examples for all these actions are found in the Bible, especially the New Testament of Christ. The challenge that we as Christians, and I always use that term, as it's used in the Bible, defined by the Bible, members of the Lord's Church. The challenge Christians face pertains to our discerning. Now, here's where wisdom plays a part in our conduct, when especially, but always, but when especially when we're being persecuted because we are Christians. There must be discernment in every given case. It must be evaluated. And the response, therefore, will determine many times in our lives what the nature of the persecution is. And this has to do in varying degrees of it, where it comes from and so forth. Now, having said that, I realize in discussing this under these three main topics, I can't cover everything that might come up as to how you deal with it. I am wanting us to think more about the fact that while over the time the United States has been here and the protection of the Constitution avails toward the practice of religion and so on, that that can shift because the Constitution actually makes provision for it to be amended and you don't know what will happen. All I know is, is that if I look at history and what the Bible teaches, together, there's never been a period of time that's gone for a very long time that God's people have not been persecuted because of their beliefs and practices. So I want to look, first of all, at avoiding persecution. In situations where the church is exposed to a stronger degree of persecution, and I primarily mean by that, where there's a unified effort brought about by government and laws and so forth to bring it about on the church, then it's, I think, considered prudent to ask whether and how persecution could be avoided. But here, here's the guideline always in that. Without compromising the truth of God's Word. There's your guideline. That always must be there. There may be ways I can avoid it, but never if it means me compromising the gospel of Christ or compromising my conduct. And that's why that Jesus taught so much about taking up your cross daily and following him. There must be the reality that we will suffer. All who live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So there's no escaping it completely. But like I said last week, just because Christians are going to be persecuted for their faithful conduct doesn't mean that there's a cross out there. Let me hurry over there and let them nail me to it. 
Well, they're burning Christians today. Let me not miss out on, on that. Or whatever may be happening. Occasions are recognized in which God directed his people to avoid or to flee. We go back to the Old Testament. Now remember, Paul said in the Old Testament for Christians... Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans 15, 4. And you'll remember that God himself instructed the great prophet Elijah to avoid the persecution of King Ahab and send him off to hide in 1 Kings 19, 1 through 18. So there was a time for that, wasn't it? And other times he didn't though, did he? Now, that's what I mean by wisdom on our part to know I guess it would be when to run and hide and when not to run and hide. Because none of these people, like Elijah, none of the prophets that were faithful, ever compromised their responsibility to God and the reason God called them when they fled, when they ran. And they always did it at the direction of God. You remember also that after our Lord's birth, and because of King Herod wanting to destroy all the babies in Bethlehem, that God also instructed Joseph to flee to Egypt with the newborn Jesus, Matthew 2, 13 through 18. Again, you must realize a special situation on that. This is the Son of God in the care of Mary and Joseph. And they're expected to preserve him, and God intervenes and deals with that. But nevertheless, to escape Herod, he ran. God directed him to go. And then when you come into Jesus' own ministry, he at times went into hiding, Matthew 4 and verse 12, John 8, verse 59, and other places. But there was a reason for that. And the scripture says in John 7 and verse 30, because his time had not yet come. Remember, Christ knew that he came in this world to die. To this end was I born, he said. So these are temporary things with him. The time was not yet right for him to become the Lamb of God, sacrificed for the sins of the world. There would only be a certain particular time that he would be ready to do that. So our Lord's escape from suffering and death was simply a postponement, keeping in God's good care and providential guidance that was postponed. Well, it may be the case even with us in certain situations. But let me give you that guideline again. We don't hide and we don't flee if it's going to compromise the truth of God and if it's going to hinder the work of the Lord's church. So Jesus didn't pull away from confrontation with any of the religious leaders of his day. I guess you could say his, um, his work his earthly ministry was not characterized, and we'll put this in air quotes, by tactical moves or compromise in any form to avoid suffering. Now, I know as a human being, he didn't want to go to the cross if there was any other way possible to accomplish the salvation of man. He even prayed. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Well, I see no reason why as a Christian, in fact, I see all sorts of reasons to the contrary, why we should be praying, we must be praying, I should say, to be able to face all things, whether we're being persecuted by a certain group or the government, anybody else, or family or whatever. There, have, there are people even in the, the freedoms we enjoy in this nation protected under the rights of the Constitution, there are people who through families and friends have been uh, persecuted because they obeyed the gospel. I've known of several situations where people were sent packing by their family because they obeyed the gospel. When Jesus sent his disciples on what we know is the limited commission, limited because he only sent them to the Jews, you realize that was designed to get the truth out to them, but it was also a practice session, you might say, for what's going to happen under the Great Commission. He told them when they were persecuted in one town to leave it and to go to some other place. But what was the reason for that? Well, remember the guideline. If leaving something compromises the gospel, 
does not allow you to discharge your obligation to God as set out by the authoritative will of God, you don't do it. So what was the reason for that? So the gospel could be preached throughout and to the people of that time, Matthew 10, 23. As I said, it served also as a practice of what took place under the Great Commission when they were commissioned to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. So then when you get down to the church established as Luke records in Acts chapter 2, you see immediately that the apostles did not alter the message, the saving message of the gospel, that in the very city where just a few days before Jesus had been crucified, they stood up and proclaimed the whole counsel of God and Peter's message even said that ye have taken him with wicked hands of crucified and slain. That still must be done. There is nothing I can offer today that says under any and all circumstances, situations, and places that you can so live as not to be persecuted when you know already the Bible said if you're faithful, you will suffer persecution to some degree in some way. It may be from family, maybe from a, from a, a wife or a husband even. You know, we forget sometimes that as the gospel went out in that pagan world, you might have a wife that hears the gospel, she obeys it, but the, but the husband remains a pagan. That even caused questions to be raised about their marriage being legitimate before God in uh, Paul's writing to the Corinthians. But you remember that after the death of Stephen, a great persecution came upon the church. And as I said this morning, all the brethren there left Jerusalem, save the apostles. And they went everywhere, Acts 8, verse 1, preaching the word. Now, I think it's important to recognize more about that example. They didn't leave because they were cowards. They didn't leave and in leaving compromise the gospel or omit their duty under the Great Commission to preach the gospel. I don't know whether we've ever noticed it, but in reading the book of Acts, Luke records the beginning of the church really just before the beginning of it, but then the beginning of the church in Acts 2. And then he shows you how they followed the plan the Holy Spirit laid out, that it was to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And look at every case of conversion as you start in Jerusalem, and you see it spread just according to the divine pattern of how it was to be spread there early on. But have you noticed before the persecution, following the death of Stephen, they weren't going? Have you ever noticed that? They were not going. It took a persecution to get them to do what the Great Commission said. Because it actually says, as you are going, preach the gospel to every creature. Well, as they fled the persecution, they did that, didn't they? They went to Samaria. And we have the account of Philip then going to Samaria, preaching and establishing the church there. So we need to understand that that's not an example of people just trying to dodge out on their responsibility. So mark that down. We're giving advantage to the devil if to avoid any kind of persecution to any degree we try to shirk our responsibility in living the Christian life, whatever it may be, or in preaching the whole truth, the whole counsel of God, or any aspect of it. Thus, whatever the government may do, or whatever who may do, we have the obligation to sit down and think, what can we do about it? Now, we've been used to operating in a free society, so the church is allowed to own property, or rent property. It's allowed to own its own building. But you remember when you go back to the first century and then following thereafter, people did not openly meet that way. They hid. I remember, and I may have used this as an example some time ago when I talked uh, many years ago, to Brother Odie Skatewood, he's been dead for a number of years, but he and a few others were into Germany right after World War II, were the first one to uh, preach there. And then later on, he located in Austria and went many times in what was then the Iron Curtain countries of Eastern Europe and into Russia. 
And he was even called in one time by the KGB and interrogated for a while. He had made provision before that ever happened for a will to be written and for everything to be ready in case something like that did happen. So all that was taken care of. He made provision for that. Well, there's one thing we do is that we make provision when, if we live in a society where you can expect that kind of thing, especially a concerted effort and, by the law, a legal effort to persecute you. He said when they would go out to baptize people, they would have to go out into a general area in a lake where people swim or sometimes in the sea. And they always had a KGB agent following them. He didn't, or she didn't, either one, try to hide herself. But she was there. She didn't bother them. She was there just going along. She wasn't, a, she wasn't somebody that identified herself, but they, they knew. So when they would go baptizing, they would wade right out into the water. Here are all these other people swimming. And they would just immerse the person under the water. Said, I've done that when the agent was standing on the shore like that, looking and trying to figure out what was going on. <laughs> That's what I said a minute ago about having to be careful. And that ties in with what Paul says. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Now that's good for us no matter when we're living, what kind of laws we're under. No matter what kind of freedom we have. But you take it and apply it to a time when you're being spied upon. When your neighbor, neighbor may be watching you. Remember you don't do any of that to the point in escaping persecution where you neglect your responsibility to God. That's being faithful. So there may very well be a time when be thou faithful unto, unto many in order to a given end unto death in this case, Revelation 2.10. That's why Jesus spoke as he did in vaccinating the apostles and those who would be members of the church later on. There's times when you just have to undergo persecutions. I thought about just bringing the list of all those things that are about Paul and what he suffered because of Christ. And I really went looking for it, intending to do that. But brethren, I would have to be reading for the next 30 minutes. You may not realize that. Just reading what he underwent. And either explicitly it's given in the Bible in just so many words or else it implies. Sometimes we read through things pretty quickly and don't realize what that's implying that he underwent for the cause of Christ. And I promise you, Paul was mindful of any way possible to get out from under persecution if it did not involve him compromising the truth or not being faithful. And thus you'll see that Paul did some of the same thing in his preaching trips when he was persecuted when it came to leaving town. Acts 8 and verse 1, 9, verse 9, or chapter 9, verse 25, and then chapter 11, verse 19, chapter 14, verses 5 through 6. There were times when people would not hear it. Well, remember, we're not there to be like Islam and take a sword and say you're either going to convert or I'm going to cut your head off. Christianity is not spread by force. Come let us reason together. Paul reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. Now I think that pretty well describes all the teaching he ever did. You just have to look at the particulars he might have dealt with and you can see that in his letters as to the particulars that he would have put under each one of those main points if you wanted each one of them to be a main point in the sermon. Righteousness, temperance, self-control, and judgment to come. In one way or the other, our teaching of the gospel covers all of that. And that's what he did. So Paul at times said, well, they won't hear me here. I'll go somewhere else. And that gets into an interesting thing too. Are we willing to go somewhere else? In our fleeing persecution to carry the gospel out. You see, we don't want to let our work go undone, and that work is as the church to spread the gospel of Christ and defend the faith. So even if we go somewhere else, we go with the idea we're going to teach the truth there just like we did here. We're going to defend the truth there just like we did wherever we were 
such as the church in Jerusalem having to flee there because of persecution. Now, from the foregoing, we can learn some things. As I say, this is kind of general, but I'm giving you credit to thinking through some specifics that may come upon you in your life, whether it's on the job or in school or wherever it might be. We learn that flight, and I'll be repeating myself here and giving emphasis, that flight or avoidance of persecuted, of persecution is permitted under certain circumstances but considered forbidden where obedience to God's commandments and Christ's commission and love for others would be hindered or jeopardized. That's just a general truth we draw from the totality of what the Bible says about the matter of fleeing persecution and what governs that. So we have no right to run from it, so to speak, if it means we don't fulfill our duty to God. That is, if running from it will not let us discharge our obligations to God, which would have to do with preaching the gospel, living before men righteously, and defending it. Then we see the avoidance of distress and pain is not accepted as the supreme good by our God and is not taught such in the scriptures. But here's what is the supreme good, obedience to God regardless of the cost. That's why we studied last Sunday morning the cost of discipleship. What's the whole duty of man according to the writer of Ecclesiastes long before you get to the church in the New Testament? Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty duty of man and if you can't do that because you run there's something wrong and we also have the example when we look into the New Testament of Mark who went with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey until he got to a certain point now the Bible doesn't tell us why he left Barnabas and Paul. I've heard some people say, well, he was longing for his girlfriend back there in Antioch of Syria. Well, I don't know. He may have. But that's where he failed evidently from seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness as to the reason that he was with him in the first place. And Paul says that was to minister to us in view of why we were there and what we were doing. And, you know, uh, he didn't want to He didn't want to deal with him in taking him on the second journey. Barnabas did. They had division over that. Barnabas is his uncle, remember. And so he took him and went to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas, went on the second missionary journey. So actually, out of that came two missionary journeys. Back to Cyprus with Mark and Barnabas, and then Paul going back where Paul and Barnabas had been the first time, but going back with Silas the second time. So remember that. Simply to avoid persecution because you're just distressed and got you upset, going to lose your house are you going to be prohibited from shopping somewhere are your neighbors are killing your pets or giving you ugly gestures and calling you names that's no excuse to cease doing what God obligates you to do to be faithful in fact I, I can't cover all of this but I would suggest that each one of those instances that might arise from something like that you still might have the opportunity to use those as stepping stones to teach people certain things. But I have to evaluate all the things that might happen to you and to me is to know when it's better to step aside or when it's better to stand, uh, when it's better to do those things. But I know the ultimate guideline. Let me say it again. To run and in running so neglect our obligation to God that we're unfaithful to Him is sinful. We can't do that. That's just an underlying guide for you when you sit down and consider things. Being quiet when we ought to speak up. And maybe speaking up when we should be quiet, choosing a better time to speak up. How we speak up. I don't know all the things as to cause what's what. I think I've mentioned several times, uh, 
When Jody and I first married, one of the elders owned a used car lot, and I drove down there to see him. I think she was with me. And there's some old man that hung out at those car lots like they do. When I rolled down the window and asked where the elder was, he began to answer. He wasn't cussing me, but he was cussing up a storm, using the Lord's name in vain. And he got through, and I said, do you pray to God like that always? Well, that set him back on his heels. He, he, he actually didn't know whether he heard me right. And he said, what? I said, I ask you if you pray to God like that always. And he didn't know what to say. He said, what do you mean? I said, you've been asking God to damn this and God to damn that. I just wondered if that's the way you pray to him always. Well, he didn't know what to do. He literally didn't know what to do. I wish I could think that quick on everything that comes up along that line. Uh, we talk, or Jody talked to a neighbor. These folks aren't even members of the church last week. All this mess going on when a few things were open where you get gasoline and People didn't get gasoline. They were all up there trying to get it. And everybody's all worn to a frazzle and on edge. And this fellow said one guy came by. We, they were letting people in, and he let somebody in. The other guy didn't want him to because that held him up, and he just gave him a good cussing right there. He said, what I did was just point my finger at him and smile and said, you have a good day. So the guy apologized to him. So how you respond does make a difference. And it means self-control and thinking ahead. And all the time we don't. There have been times I wish I had thought as fast as I did. I'm not. But you've got to think about that. That comes down then to even the government. Uh, it's how we approach things. And I'll get into that in just maybe just a minute. The next point is enduring persecution. Now that's, I've never been arrested and put in jail for preaching like I'm preaching right now. I found out one time after the fact that because I'd been studying with this woman, her husband and her, fa her, her father-in-law, being about half drunk, came to the church building looking for me and the elders were there. I told them, well, I'm glad it was the elders, not me. <laughs> but the point is, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what it's like to be to have the government come in. What would you do today? What would you do right now if the government came in here and arrested this whole crowd and started to jail? What would be the first thing across your mind? Because you are members of the Church of Christ. They would do that. What would cross your mind? What would be your first, your first response? I would say I would start thinking about, or already I'm thinking about it, I'm a citizen of this country, and I have rights under the law just like everybody else. And I would think about, I'm not saying a word like it me an attorney. And then I would begin to go just that route. But it's realized that avoiding persecution or fleeing may be at times impossible, impractical, maybe inappropriate. So in those times, God's people, in being faithful to stand firm where they are, as I said earlier, may have to die for it. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Revelation 2, 10. Indeed, during, enduring persecution as an expected event for the greater purposes of God is in fact the most broadly attested biblical directive regarding a response to persecution. Now, I don't think we ever ought to lose sight of that. When we've done everything we could through law and our rights in this Constitution, I speak now mainly for us here in America who are Christians, that we have the obligation to fight. Now, I know also in Pakistan, which is an Islamic nation, but under their Constitution, they're guaranteed religious freedom. But, you know, 90% of them, if not higher, are Islamic and everything they think of is along that line. And I, I know one man who has suffered greatly. He had... Um, what they considered to be, his name was Islamic. And since he wasn't a practicing the Islamic religion, they were demanding he give up his name because it's to be used by a Muslim, not a Christian. And he went with them to court and all of that and fought it. It's my name. It was given to me by my parents, and I'm going to keep it. Well, he had to go through some of the struggles of the legal whatever's in that nation. Well, I don't know when something like happen like that here what if wearing a christian becomes a hate term it could it was back in the first century 
Perseverance, therefore, and wisdom and prayer and a willingness to suffer where you have to rather than compromise the truth is needful. So perseverance is expounded as a crucial virtue through a, a mul multiple biblical characters. Uh, do I need to go back to the Old Testament? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They would not bow down. Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. And they were fully aware of the consequences. There was no getting around that. Daniel 3, 8 through 30. Coming to the New Testament, we've already mentioned him. The Apostle Paul on several occasions demonstrated his readiness to endure the consequences of his work as an apostle and an evangelist, even unto death. And so he wrote in Philippians 1, 20 through 26, in chapter 2, verse 17. And you'll remember that he was steadfast in going to Jerusalem when he knew that he was going to be arrested. Acts 21, 10 through 14. He not, remember how he said, what mean you to, to weep and to cry over me? I'm not only ready to be arrested, but to die in Jerusalem for the name of Christ. Christian spirituality is defined by the way in which we endure persecution. And choose to respond to it. And it's a response to it that I can't answer in every case other than the general guideline. However we respond to it, we must not violate God's will in so doing. We can use expediently as an advantage laws that apply to everybody else. Paul did that. We'll say more about that in a moment. So our credibility is seen in our faithfulness to Christ. Our love as brethren to one another and how that love for God and man, especially our brethren in Christ, but also loving our neighbors ourselves, even loving our enemies, doing good to them that persecute you. And certainly it foregoes all violence on our part. Sometimes in debating atheists who have no knowledge of true Christianity and do not separate it, from Roman Catholicism, denominationalism will stand up and begin to get all over the person who's proving the existence of God by saying, look what you Christians did in the Crusades to the Muslims or what you did in the Spanish Inquisition uh, or even what has happened in Northern Ireland years ago in the fighting between Catholics and Protestants. And the response to that is, I abhor that as much as you do, if not more, because it has nothing to do with the teaching of the New Testament. It's in violation of the New Testament. Those people weren't Christians. Well, he, I promise you, if you deal with most atheists in that way, they don't want to do because they don't understand what Christianity is or how to identify a true New Testament Christian. They just lump it all together. Of course, this stands in stark contrast to the antagonistic world in which we live and what the world does to Christians and how they think they're to be stamped out. But God has seen fit to take the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And when Christians stand up as Christians practicing the truth in dealing with persecution and opposition, they are showing to the world something the world doesn't understand. The world understands a club upside the head. The world understands threats persecution in the sense of being put into jail because of what you believe. So it doesn't understand praying for your enemies. It doesn't understand anything like that. Now look at Paul and Barnabas in the inner prison in Philippi there because they preached the gospel. Feet fast in the stocks. They're in miserable condition physically. And yet at midnight, what did the other prisoners who may have been there because they deserved to be there, the other prisoners, what did they hear? I heard them singing praises to God. Impacted them. It's how we respond to persecution. And again, you see that they could have run when the earthquake opened up the prison. But when the jailer, being a pagan, knew he was responsible and had to give account for all those prisoners fleeing, thought they had all run off, he was going to kill himself. And Paul said, do thyself no harm, for we're all here. That would have been a time some people run, but Paul didn't. He stayed there. And then what else did he do? You remember when they found out, uh-oh, we've treated a Roman citizen contrary to the laws of Rome. So they sent a message. And they said, well, go ahead and let them go. You remember what Paul did? He was bold. He said, 
they put us in here and have beaten us Romans and uncondemned. Now, he's speaking to the mayor and the city council, so to speak. Let them come down here personally and publicly let us out and let everybody know what they've done. Paul forced their hand. Now, he didn't have to do that. But the inspired scriptures tells us that's what he did, and he was an apostle directed by God to do it. So you see, there, he didn't just run, did he? He held their feet to the fire and made them face their own disobedience to Roman law. And that was in Philippi. That was a Roman colony. And Roman colonies prided themselves in being as true to Caesar as they were in Rome. And that was a big embarrassment for those folks. So combining the obligation for all Christians to endure persecution and the option of avoiding it under certain circumstances, there is a third response that we want to look at. This is the possibility that God may call Christians to resist persecution. I've already introduced that, mentioning some of the ways that we can resist. There are times when it's appropriate to fight for one's legal rights. But when I say fight, I don't mean fight like the world does. I mean a, a appeal, as Paul did as a Roman citizen, to take himself out of a kangaroo court when he says, I've done no harm to those folks in Jerusalem. They can't make their accusations stick. They can't prove them. I appeal to Caesar where I ought to be judged. That immediately under Roman law took him out from under anything there locally. Now there's a lesson in that. You also will remember when in Corinth certain ones appeared before Gallio over religious matters. And Gallio, acting as he would as a judge under Roman law, sitting in the judgment seat, which, by the way, that judgment seat is right over this day with his name on it. When he realized it was a question about their religious matters, I'm not going to hear you on this. If it was about legal matters under the law, I would bear with you, but I'm not going to hear this. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Now, English common law is based in Roman law, and guess where our laws of America in jurisprudence based? It's based on English common law. That has been used in courts to say that a secular court has no say over religious matters. Now, you're going to have to have lawyers that may know where to go to find that stuff to defend you if you do decide to fight. But I would have no problem if on the job somebody began to threaten me because I exercised my free religion that was a part of my faith, telling me, you can't do that here. I wouldn't. And so saying, go bow up and get mad. I think probably what I would do, circumstances, all the cases, of course, and I can't see all those circumstances and cases, but I think I would ask them kindly in a letter written in official. Are you trying to violate my rights under the Constitution in my practice of religion, which the Constitution says not even the Congress can make laws to do that? But now when you start down that road, you've got to be able to stick with it. You've got to be willing to go through it. But I think we better have that kind of thing in our mind, especially you younger people, if you're going to stay faithful to God at what is upheld in the future and how things are done. But we're not, as Christians, and I'm speaking primarily in this country, but really it's anywhere. Paul never lived under laws like we have, yet he used what he had. And so we need to be aware. And you know, to Timothy, he asked that uh, certain legal people, lawyers be sent to him. They were profitable to him. Well, what did an apostle of Christ baptize in the Holy Spirit, what did he need with lawyers in Rome? Same reason we'd need one. <laughs> to be sure he knew what was going on and what was right and how he was to use it. So there's times when it's appropriate to fight one's legal rights. Now, I think we need to be very mindful as Christians of our legal rights under the Constitution and when it comes to our own jobs, when people threaten us with things, you need to be, we don't need to run from it. We need to respond to it. And we need to say, are you telling me this? Is that going to be your policy? 
Because I tell you, they will run more scared sometimes than you realize when they think about where this leads because they are very mindful where such as this leads. And are you willing to do that? You've got to be faithful. You've got to be determined. You've got to be steadfast. You've got to be unmovable. You've got to be abounding always in the work of the Lord in this area of the work of the Lord. And you're going to evaluate every particular thing as to what you say and do and how you respond. Jesus, you'll remember, defended himself at one point during his own trial, John 18, verse 23. Not to protest his suffering, but simply as a testimony of his own innocence. Yet he remained silent through the rest of the trial. Because nobody could convict him of sin. He even asked one time the Jews, which of you convicted me of sin? Only the Son of God could do that. But he did. Because it was a lesson to them. You can't do it. Paul even did the same thing when he appeared before Felix Festus and Agrippa. He made it clear. They made these charges. They can't prove a one of them. They can't prove a one of them. Paul demonstrated resistance through use of Roman law. Think about what he did when he warned through his uh, nephew's information that 40 men had decided they would eat nothing or drink anything until they killed him. He said, you go tell a chief captain. Now, he was a Roman citizen. That bore a tremendous amount of power in those days. And what did Rome do to a man who was a prisoner to protect him? They put together a small army to guard Paul all the way to Caesarea because he was a Roman citizen. Paul didn't mind using that. He had that right as a Roman citizen, and he used that right to defend him and take him out from under the kangaroo court of the chief priests and scribes in Jerusalem. That's not just written to take up space. You learn from that. You see how he did those things. Acts 16, 36 through 39, and you can look on into chapter 22, verses 24 through 29, chapter 25, verses 10 through 11. Why does Luke by inspiration put that in there? Why did the Lord want that in there about an apostle of Christ who gave up so much and suffered so much for the cause of Christ? Because it teaches us. Don't you think people of the first century would have understood that and drawn lessons from it and applied it to their own lives? So with his knowledge of the law and his own rights as a citizen of the Roman Empire, Paul was able to avoid persecution by resisting it. So there's a time to resist, isn't it? But it is important to note that both Jesus and Paul exercise this choice under specific premises and for specific purposes. And that's the reason we must be fair and honest and know the book as to what is advantageous in our conduct, whether it's one-on-one or dealing with the government. I might mention this in passing for whatever it's worth. But much of the persecution that came upon the early church, even after the first century, wasn't always a Roman Empire persecution. There might be a governor, say like Pilate, over a certain province who just simply doesn't want to tolerate this or he's trying to prove something to Rome, then I can out-Rome Rome and prove my loyalty to Caesar who might bring persecution down in that area when under another place, another governor, they might not care one way or the other. Look at the difference in Pilate and uh, Sergius Paulus in Cyprus. You don't find Pilate being called a prudent man and calling for Jesus to hear what he said, but you do find that concerning the governor there in Cyprus calling for Paul to hear about it. And right there in front of the governor, when a false Jew stood up to try to stop him, Paul exercised the miracle and made him go blind. And then the governor listened to the message. So each case demands we be wise in these things. So like fleeing, resisting is permissible. But here's the guideline. Unless it hinders the furtherance of the kingdom of God or causes you to compromise your own life, anything God expects of you in order to be faithful. 
Now, how am I going to answer specifically for everybody, when do Christians disobey civil government? Well, in general, you, you always obey civil government, according to Romans 13, or you sin. Well, when do you disobey? Well, in Acts chapter 4, 16 through 20, it was when they were charged in that given instance, do not preach any longer in Jesus' name. And their response was, you have to be judged of that. We cannot but preach the things we've seen and heard. You can't just say, well, they won't let me operate my business on the Sabbath, and I'm a Christian and I don't keep the Sabbath, so I'm going to disobey. No, that doesn't have a thing in the world to do with your uh, hindering you in the practice of Christianity. There has to be some sense about things, and when something actually, by obeying that law, causes you to violate God's law, either commission or omission, then you can disobey it, and you ought to disobey it. So it can't be something you just don't like. I'm thankful under the law, churches don't have to pay taxes. But what if the law has changed and churches have to pay taxes? Does that mean we just don't pay taxes? We disobey the government? I don't think so. It just means we've enjoyed for a long time the protection of the law under that. But now it's changed. I don't know that it restricts me from anything that I have to do to go to heaven. I don't like it. don't like it at all. I wouldn't like it if as an individual citizen of this country, we didn't have any taxes, income tax. At one time they did, you know. And I certainly wouldn't like it if they made laws to where we have to, and they did one time. But Jesus made it clear on things like that and gave a guideline doing it that we're to pay our taxes. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. One of the things wrong with Roman Catholicism is that it tries to make the church govern everything. The home, civil government, and run it all. And God never meant for that to happen. So you have to know the Bible well enough, be determined enough to, to measure your own situation and to think before you act. If you're unsure, get together and talk. You know, one of the things you'll learn if it ever comes down in a church like this, you'll learn the importance of fellowship with faithful Christians. You think a uh, matter, and I'll close here. I'll just add this other one to it. When you read in the New Testament, Master's responsibility to their slaves and slaves' responsibility to their masters. It would not be what is said today in this country and years ago. Paul said that the slaves obey masters. And then he tells the masters how to treat the slaves. People don't understand that. But that's exactly what the Bible said because people were taught out of it due to human work that the gospel caused them to see. That's how it all ended. And so we must understand that's transferred over to employees and employers. I've got to ask that question regarding an employer or what a company expects me to do before I get to be a part of that company. You have to be open and above board. What are you willing to do? Do we ever think when we're looking for a job that we need to sit down with the employer and explain to them our religion, our faith, and our obligations? I doubt it. We've coasted so long in the freedoms of this nation. It's become a part of us, and we don't even think about that. But we may ought to in view of where we're going in this country. So Christians in the United States have personal rights guaranteed them by the U.S. Constitution. And may these constitutional rights not be used to protect our free exercise of living as the New Testament teaches us to live. I would say, if not, why not? Well, of course they do. And we ought to use them. Now, I would like to say in closing the lesson, you may have specific questions in these areas I can't cover because I can't can't foresee everything or even know your specific situation. And if there are enough of those questions, we'll just simply have a question and answer session on Sunday afternoon and try to answer them. So if you have them, write them down. Be specific so I know what you're talking about. And I'll do my best to give you a thus saith the Lord answer.
to any particular problems as it fits your given situation. One of the things years ago that made a difference, you know, when we preach, we don't know all what's on each individual's mind and any particular that person may have he needs help with. We may cover everything in general, uh, the whole counsel of God. But in applying it to one's life, you don't always know what that's involved. Question and answer sessions help you deal with that. I've been around and been a part of too many open forums where I've seen that dealt with and things would be dealt with in the question and answer session that you might not think of or could get to in a regular sermon dealing in general with a certain matter. So if you do that, if you have those questions, feel free to write them down. Or if you think of questions that's not specifically concerning you or anybody you know but would be a good question, put that in there so we can address it specifically as you ask it. Closing the lesson, if you're not a Christian, it's another time you have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be forgiven of your sins, to be a Christian. Believing in Christ the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him as the Son of God, and completing your obedience to the gospel by being baptized for the remission of sins into Christ. The Lord adding you to His church and there to live faithful. A child of God, if you have stumbled and fallen and what you've done has been a public reproach on the church. Repent of that. Come confessing it and praying God for forgiveness. Let us all rise up together as one under the authority of Christ and living according to the doctrine of Christ and march toward heaven with the unity that God expects the church to have. If you're subject to the blessed invitation of our Lord, then we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.